So, uh, Devin, do you want to present? Uh, yeah, sure, I can go. So are you able to share your PowerPoint? Yeah, I'm just finding which. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's, that's fine. I'm not trying to hassle you. <laughs> I just want to make sure <laughs> everything's working. So. Yeah, there was some, uh, there's last minute clinical stuff happening, so. I didn't have quite as much time to get ready as I thought I would. No problem. All right. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. I'll just get started then. So hi, everyone. I hope you're well. My name is Devin. And today for my LabMP project, I'll be talking about genetic engineering and what it might hold for the future of humanity. So to start off with, before we can really consider what the future might hold, we need some basic understanding of how it works. And I'm sure all of you know this already, but just to be thorough, we'll go over it quickly. Uh, so the design of our species is encoded in our DNA in units called genes. So this affects things from like how we look to all sorts of physical characteristics and we can use uh, specific tools to alter these genes, genes such as talons or ZFNs or the more commonly known CRISPR-Cas9 system. Uh, so for now, the next couple slides, we'll just go over brief overviews of how the system works so we can uh, better understand the implications. So uh, first we'll go over ZFNs or zinc finger nucleases and talons, uh, which is short for transcription activator like effector nucleases. Uh, so both of these are nucleases, which means that they can cleave DNA strands in the genome. Uh, they are mostly made up of two main domains. There's a FOC1 domain, which is responsible for non specific cleavage of DNA. And then there's also DNA binding domains. And the main difference between these two systems is in these binding domains. So uh, for zinc finger nucleases, uh, the binding domain is a what's called a zinc finger, which is essentially a tendril of amino acids coordinated by a zinc ion. And it is uh, that domain that has sequence specificity, which means uh, it can seek out certain spots in the genome. And then in combination with that cleavage domain, it, uh, it induces a double strand break in certain areas. And so very similar, but a more uh, modern take on this sort of system is using the talons. And that replaces the DNA binding domain with uh, a domain derived from bacterial proteins. Uh, it's just a more efficient way of doing it is all. But uh, we can imagine that if we can customize those binding domains, scientists would be able to search for specific sequences and therefore specific genes where we can cut the DNA strands. And then once we cut the DNA strands, there's two main endogenous repair mechanisms. So on the right here, we have the non-homologous end joining. So that basically just fuses the two ends together. Uh, they mostly use this for uh, inactivating genes or creating knockout genes because it tends to be more error prone. And then on the left, we have a situation where if you add a DNA template to it, you'll have what's called homologous recombination. So you'll be able to insert a desired gene that you put in the mixture uh, once you create the double strand break. So understanding that we can move on to CRISPR-Cas9, which is 
arguably the most popular gene editing platform that we currently have. Uh, it's what most people, uh, what the average person would probably know if they know about gene editing at all. So it was derived from initially the innate immunity of bacteria. So it has two main units, just like the zinc finger nucleases and the talons. We have the CRISPR domain, which is just uh, repeat sequences uh, interposed as spacers. And it's those spacers that are responsible for the, what is quote unquote, the genetic memory of the cell. So when a virus would infect the cell with its genetic material, the CRISPR-Cas9 system would integrate it into the plasmid. And if it was ever infected in the future, that immune system would uh, be responsible for destroying it. And to destroy it, they use the Cas domain. And the Cas domain creates Cas enzymes, which is what's responsible for cleaving the DNA strands. And so here's just a, a simple infographic of how it might work. So we can see the guide RNA, which would be generated by the CRISPR sequence. And then that creates a complex with the Cas9 enzyme. So then the guide RNA guides that enzyme to certain spots in a genome. And then it creates a cut along the genome. And then we have both repair mechanisms to either insert a gene or to uh, inactivate it. So knowing what these tools are capable of, we might think to ourselves, well, what sort of future applications could we have? So obviously there's just way too many to list, but I've, uh, I'm gonna go over four here pretty quickly. Uh, so here we can use CRISPR to treat hereditary conditions like thassalemia. And thassalemia is basically an inherited blood disorder where your body won't produce enough hemoglobin. So if we can use CRISPR to uh, alter that gene so that it's working properly, it'll end up producing the correct amount of hemoglobin, and then the patient will essentially be cured. Uh, and then here on the top right, we have uh, potential for CRISPR to be used in cancer treatments. So I did read that there are currently studies that are looking at genetically modifying immune cells, such as T cells, for cancer immunotherapy to go after cancerous tumors and stuff like that. And then here in the bottom right, uh, we can see potential for using CRISPR to uh, sort of control communicable diseases. Uh, one example might be with malaria. So you can imagine a situation where you genetically engineer mosquitoes so that they're less likely to carry that disease. And then you release them and then they interbreed with the, with the natural mosquitoes. And then eventually that more uh, safe gene would spread throughout the wild population and uh, prevent malaria from being as much of a problem. And then finally, we also have potential agricultural uses. So for example, in wheat, uh, maybe it's possible to find a gene that increases the yield or perhaps makes it more immune to infection and therefore uh, more reliable as a food source. But uh, for the next few minutes, the two main areas of gene editing I'd like to go over are uh, with organ transplants and with designer babies. So starting out with traditional transplants, uh, I'm sure you remember a few weeks ago where uh, we had Dr. Montgomery and we also had Dr. Solez talk about this. But uh, last year in the United States, approximately 30,000 out of 130,000 people who were eligible for an organ transplant actually received one. So that would be mostly kidneys, livers, and hearts. Uh, but as we can see on the graph on the right side, uh, the transplant list has been growing exponentially for quite a few years. And a major reason for that is that we simply don't have enough 
either deceased or living donors to keep up with demand. Uh, but then we also have risks from acute and chronic rejection. And then there's also risks from the associated immunosuppressants that they use. So thinking back to uh, some solutions to these problems and thinking back to Dr. Montgomery's lecture, we can look at potentially transplanting organs from different species, which is called xenotransplantation. Uh, so much like what Dr. Montgomery and Brad Ferris talked about, we could create transgenic pigs without the non-human sugars and proteins that are in those tissues. Uh, I think with Dr. Montgomery's presentation, they looked at uh, removing glycans uh, in the pig tissue. And it would be these sugars and proteins that would uh, collect an immune response from the recipient. And then that would often result in rejection or at least significant problems. But we can also look at introducing human genes to make them more compatible with people. So I did read a few studies where they looked at introducing uh, a human CD73 gene to replace the porcine CD73 gene. Uh, the pig, that specific pig gene uh, has reduced adenosine production compared to humans because we have different coagulation systems. And that reduced adenosine ended up or resulted in increased coagulation and organ rejection. So if you can use CRISPR to replace that specific gene with the human version, we could uh, produce the correct amount of adenosine and hopefully prevent a lot of that coagulation. So as you can see, both inactivating porcine genes and introducing native human genes would help reduce the chances of organ rejection. Yeah, and here's just a, uh, a summary slide of what we just talked about. One interesting thing I will point out that isn't quite related to gene editing, but it's still pretty cool nonetheless, is that uh, they also uh, inserted pig bone marrow into the recipients. And then the progenitor cells from that bone marrow would grow up into uh, pig immune cells. So then the patient would theoretically be more tolerant of the transplanted organ and wouldn't even require immunosuppressants after a while. So now we can move on to designer babies, which is what an issue most people think of when they think of gene editing. It's kind of a hot button issue in the media and places like that. Uh, but one uh, pretty prevalent example we can think of is those Chinese twins that were genetically modified a few years ago to make them more immune to HIV by uh, replacing one of the genes. Uh, so that obviously received a lot of backlash because they cut ethical corners and stuff, but it was still uh, a medical innovation at the time and still is. So uh, some things to consider when we're looking at designer babies is that there is a, a very large potential to improve their health, either to uh, reduce the risk while they're being born or to reduce the chances that they uh, develop conditions later in life. That, that would obviously be, good, be a good thing. But uh, there's also uh, less medically essential things that could be done, such as selecting certain desired traits like height, hair color, maybe even intelligence. And so selecting for things that are medically necessary does bring up ethical concerns. Uh, the question of whether we should be playing God often comes up when people talk about this. Uh, so whether we should even use the power to edit the genome or we should just let nature take its course. Uh, then there's also the issue of social stratification. So that can be things like uh, access to this technology, perhaps based on wealth or simply where you live. Uh, so 
there's quite a lot of social implications if this uh, if these tools were to become mainstream and designer babies actually uh became a thing before we really considered the consequences uh, but on a slightly different note we can also have designer pets so you might be able to for example select a golden retriever with a specific shade of fur perhaps but uh this really does naturally lead into discussing about the issues in gene editing. So here is a uh, a picture of the very first summit held to discuss the scientific, medical, ethical, and regulatory issues in gene editing research. Uh, this was back in 2015. Uh, here, I think that's Jennifer Doudna. She's uh, probably the most well-known person when it comes to CRISPR. Uh, and during the summit, which lasted days and days, is they concluded that there was a great amount of potential in these technologies, but we have to be very careful because you can permanently alter the genome of future generations. And if we don't know what we're doing, that could end up being very bad. So the experts there, which included both scientists, uh, ethicists, philosophers, uh, many more people, uh, they recommended that it would be a good idea to pursue further research into the editing of somatic cells, which are which would be editing genomes that couldn't be inherited by their children. Uh, so that would have clinical relevance for sure. But they also recommended against any clinical research into germline editing until the technology was further understood and there was a broad so societal consensus on how it should be used. So uh, there was quite a few perspectives that pop up when we talk about the ethics of germline editing. Uh, so the one of the more extreme ends in favor of it is where they just say the risk is similar to natural reproduction. Uh, that's not as common as the other ones, but it was put forward. Uh, there's also people who are in favor, but only in cases where there's no alternative. So it's potentially life and death. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of the uh, uh, perspectives that are in favor are conting contingent on certain conditions being met so that it's not very... Uh, uh, just go ahead and do it. There's quite a lot of restrictions still. But the two main perspectives are just holding off on that sort of clinical use until we can further understand and improve the safety and the governance. So what I mean when I talk about the governance is basically doing your best to understand the both the regulatory concerns, such as who should regulate it, how much should it be regulated, and uh, the social concerns as well. So would it result in more inequality? And will it affect different communities in, in, a, in a poor way versus a positive way? And then finally, on the other extreme end, we have just completely banning germline editing to safeguard against humanity's quote unquote hubris or uh, vanity. There's also quite a few perspectives that advocate banning for moral or religious reasons. But uh, we can also get more specific about some ethical considerations with gene editing as a whole. Uh, so first off, we can consider the issue of consent in this sort of treatment. So if we think about embryos or babies that are treated this way, uh, they can't exactly consent to it, and they might grow up to resent being a gene-edited person, and it might create some uh, social strife with their friends and family when they grow up. And then in addition, there's also social issues. Uh, we talked about this before with the stratification and access. So it might result in greater inequality or it could simply just only be available to a small subset of people for a while. And then 
thirdly, there's the issue of control. Um, do we trust governments to control this sort of genetic power? Or do we entrust hospitals or individuals or some combination in between? Uh, we also should consider unintended applications such as biological warfare, because naturally, as we advance this technology for clinical applications and stuff like that, uh, we're also going to be improving the technology for rather nefarious purposes, uh, which could obviously be rather bad for humanity if it ever uh, got into the wrong hands. And then lastly, uh, there is the issue of privacy. So who has access to genetic data and what can they do with it? Uh, we kind of see an analog to this uh, right now with social media and smartphones, where our, a lot of our personal data is shopped around already, and we don't necessarily have complete control of it. So there would be the question on whether the situation with our genetic data would be the same or if it's already happening. So starting to wrap up the discussion, we can summarize the downsides to these technology like this. Uh, so first off would be the off-target effects because we can't fully control it yet. So there's obviously going to be unintended consequences to these sorts of treatments. Uh, that could be inconsequential or they could be rather significant. Uh, but uh, downsides two and three, the germline editing being basically permanent and our lack of understanding of both uh, how turning off genes on and off affects people and how the tools itself work are uh, pretty big downsides because obviously. Uh, it has implications on the entire future of the human race. So the main conclusions to take away from this is that it obviously has great clinical potential. We can treat a lot of diseases and help a lot of people with this sort of technology. But because it's such a powerful tool, it's obviously going to be riddled with ethical and social issues like we talked about before. Uh, and those certainly aren't very easy to solve, and they probably might not ever be solved even. And there's also the issue of it becoming so powerful and getting into the wrong hands that it's used for rather dangerous applications. So there is, there is a way to relate it back to the course more concretely and so we can ask ourselves if we will see sort of a biological singularity. So there, obviously it's not self-improving like AI would be in a uh, accelerating technological singularity where it just continues out of our control, but there is potential that it could sort of get so cheap and so efficient that in a world of 7 billion people is just impossible to regulate or control. And then uh, it being so powerful would create quite a few problems, but it could also be a positive if it uh, got that widespread. It's uh, kind of impossible predict, to predict, much like the AI singularity. So here are the references. There's way too many. <laughs> uh, so that's the end of my uh, presentation, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions you have. So are, are, are any questions? So David Pierce, who has frequently taught in the course, but didn't teach this term, um, has the idea of the uh, uh, hedonic treadmill or, or like the range of feeling good or feeling bad. So the idea that humans have a right to all be happy <laughs> at the moment where 
you know, the, the, there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time unhappy. So there are genetic ways in which, at least in theory, you, you could change life so that you are more likely to be happy as a kind of, you know, default <laughs> than being neutral or sad. Do you have any thoughts about that? Does that seem desirable? Uh, um, well, that wasn't one of the things that I really read into, but uh, if I were to speculate, I would say that uh, there, like obviously being happier would be great, but there are consequences to, because unhappiness is also a motivator and sort of motivates you to be productive in various ways. So I would have questions about whether, uh, what sort of downsides being uh, artificially more happy would be. Right. Yeah, uh, Taryn ha has a question in the chat. He's curious about your thoughts on this to topic after your research. What do you think, as a, from a policy point of view, we should should be doing? Um, do you now are you now advocate for something or pushing for something or yeah? I think it kind of. I think it will kind of guide itself. I think it's like too big and powerful that even if we try to hold it back, we won't really be able to. Like we can obviously still do our best. And there, there is a uh, general consensus in the, in the gene editing research community, as far as I understand it, on what they're allowing themselves to do. But there's obviously going to be uh, rogue people who don't follow that at all. Personally, I, th I think it's a good idea to, to wait quite a while until we almost completely understand it before we uh, even start to think about messing with the hereditary editing. So, you know, the, there's, uh, there's a way of thinking about this that's very simple, but it's kind of surprising. There are a few countries in the world where the uh, history of that country has, has to do with a lot of uh, genocide. And during those genocide periods, a lot of the men die. So you, you can end up with a circumstance where most of the people leading the country and most of the legislatures legislators and so on are women and being a man becomes kind of a joke you know <laughs> like men can't be trusted and you know it, it's it's really interesting how that can happen but it it can show you kind of the the way in which this could go quite wrong in that it it could reduce diversity in the world quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. if, if certain modifications become very popular, so everybody <laughs> starts to look the same, right? Yeah, yeah. eugenics is, is a big talking point for the future of this, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, what, what, are these common understandings among scientists enough? <laughs> Probably not, but uh, it's, it's also kind of hard to regulate something like this, in my opinion, anyways. Yeah, so something else we don't teach the moment, but that we have taught in the past is uh, nanotech and nanotech also has potential big downsides and there's no um like moral training or anything that that people require to work in that 
field. The assumption is that just the human beings working in nanotech have the proper motiva motivation and kind of moral uh, beliefs, but you know, there's nothing really pushing in that direction. So there are probably a lot of areas where the issues that you raised in this talk are, are worth thinking about. And, and it's hard to know how far voluntary action is, is, is going to fix things. Sometimes you have to go probably beyond voluntary action. Okay, well, thank you very much. And we'll go on to Samadhi. Hello, uh, I'm gonna just share my screen. Can you hear me? Yes? Yeah, we, we can hear you. Okay, so if don't... I do this. Yeah, that's that's looking good. Wow, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if I do this, what can you guys see? Is it? Is oh, it says loading and now we see games as an art and an industry and exploration Yay. of the effects okay. of technology within it. <laughs> Crazy, wonderful. Okay, let me turn on my video. Okay, How do I look? okay cool. good. All right. Yeah. Um, okay, so you're seeing the screen. Everything's cool. We are. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, hi, I'm Samadhi, and today I'll be talking about games as an art and an industry. Um, so an exploration, exploration of the effects of technology within it. Um, so, oh, one second, let me just get this set up properly. Uh, I have two screens, so it's ooh, going crazy. Okay, so first off, uh, what will we be talking about today? So I want to, first off, introduce games to you guys, because um, I know some people don't play games. So just introduce like the industry, what it is and how, how it is in the current state that it is. Um, so, and then secondly, we'll be talking about why I'm talking about games. Um, so we're we're still seeing the title slide. Do you intend? For oh, really? No, I do not. Slide. Yes. There we go. Yeah. Oh, okay. So now it looks like we're on slide three. Yeah, that looks like slide. That's two. that cool? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Cool. All right. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. Okay, so we'll be, I'll be introducing games. Uh, I'll be talking about why we're talking about games, the importance of immersion. So immersion is one of the core concepts that drive games forward and the role of technology in games. So these are the four things that I'll be talking about today. Okay, it's switch slides, right? Yes, okay. So uh, first off, I would like to give a brief introduction to games, uh, the current state of games, um, how's it going in the games industry, all that wonderful stuff. So if you're in, if you're part of the games uh, community, you would know that there is this sort of divide between the types of games that are made. So there's AAA and there's indie. So I'm just going to show, sorry, I'm just going to show you uh, a couple of examples of games that I personally like, and I would highly recommend all of you play them because I think they're great. Um, to just illustrate the differences between uh, AAA and the indie game industry. So, um, so first of all, here we have Horizon Zero Dawn, wonderful we're not game. It's seeing a, it, we're we're still seeing still slide the, uh, two. Second slide. Oh, what's going on? Oh. What we'll be about. There. Is it good now? Yeah. Oh, that's weird. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, we have to do this. Is that working? Is transitions working? Well, it, I don't think so. I don't think so. No. So it, um, it's showing AAA on one side, AAA and yes. Indy on the other, and then yeah. uh, God of War and so on. Okay. Left. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. that's perfect. Okay. So uh, on the, let me just go back a couple of slides. So this first is the, the game is showing, right? There's a picture. There's yeah. a picture on the side. Okay, cool. Oh, technology. Wonderful. Um, so this game right here, it's uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. It's a really great game, uh, post-apocalyptic, and there's animatronic 
machine animals that uh, have taken over the world, basically. And you're like going through it. it it's quite interesting. So that's one example. Uh, another example, God of War. Again, a really great grain uh, looking at an interaction between um, a father and a son is how I describe it. Um, and this picture right here, it's, it's not a picture. It's actually in game. Wow, graphics, very cool. Um, and it's a Red Dead Redemption, a really great game as well. And Metro Dread, a very recent game. Uh, and this one actually uh, showcases really advanced AI. There's an AI in there that follows you around and it's spooky, but it's a very great game. So these are AAA games. Uh, they're usually larger in scale, greater graphics. They have a huge budget. They have a lot of people working in the industry. So they're generally able to make more polished and more um, I would say like bigger games. And then if we go to the indie sphere, so here's one game called Spirit Fair. It's actually, um, it's, a, it's a great game and it's about processing death. So you're a little girl and you're, you have a boat and you're acting as like a, a transporter for spirits trying to help them move on in the afterlife. It's a, it's a wonderful experience. Um, and then here we have Hollow Knight. Uh, it's actually the game that got me into the games industry. Ah, this is why I want to be a game designer potentially in the future. Um, it's a great game, wonderful art, wonderful music. Um, just amazing. Uh, more examples here, Stardew Valley. Have you ever wanted to be a farmer? You can be a farmer in this game. Have a cow, plant some carrots. <laughs> it's, it's actually a very comic experience. And I would again, um, um, implore you guys to play this game. And then finally, Stanley Parable. So all the games here um, cost money, but Stanley Parable is free. Uh, and it's a narrative experience. There's a narrator that's trying to guide you towards one specific direction and you get to choose to listen to the narrator or not. And it's kind of like a philosophical, crazy adventure. Very, it's wonderful, it's great. Highly recommend. Um, so yeah, uh, main differences just to summarize between AAA and indie. So AAA, larger teams, larger budget, budget uh, access to immense amounts of data from the players. Um, and they are usually hesitant to take risks. And this makes sense because um, they're actually, uh, they, they need to balance making the game while also making money because they invest so much money into the graphics, the team, the design. So it costs a lot. So they, they kind of need to do those kinds of things. And then indie, uh, you actually get like smaller teams, uh, lower budgets. Uh, there's no access to like specific hardware or data like AAA does have. And you actually find a lot more experimental ideas. So in the last slide, I'm, I'm sure maybe hopefully you noticed, um, there's a lot more variety in the indie game industry. And that's just because of the nature of small teams. So you're able to more likely, you're more likely to take risks. That's how I describe it. Okay, so moving on, why games? Why are we talking about games? Why should we care about the games industry? I hope the next few slides help illustrate that. Uh, so let's look at the real world impacts of games. Um, so first of all, uh, here's just a few, by the way. So the DSM-5, this was, I think, before 2016, they officially included internet gaming disorder as a uh, mental illness. So the DSM-5 is used to classify or help practitioners classify mental illnesses and gaming, internet gaming is now one of them. Um, so it's kind of become a little bit of an issue in that sense. Um, and then here, video games, uh, there's loot boxes. So uh, they, video games have started to employ, employ pretty predatory uh, practices. So there are things like loot boxes, microtransactions, and they use other types of psychologically manipulative practices that basically coerce players to spend money. So, and it's it's very much connected to gambling because a lot of the times these practices don't result in a guaranteed um, item given back to the player. So it's, it's a little bit of a problem. Um, and then here, uh, this is actually this year, uh, China decided to limit playing games for minors to only three hours a week. So it's, 
it, became, it was kind of a big deal because it's uh, a really hard stance on video games, pinning the video games as this uh, problem that it, it, we really need to regulate. And, you know, I think there's some truth to it, but I also think that um, there's a lot of scapegoating, I guess that's the word, uh, that is put onto video games. Uh, but then that's just my opinion. Um, so these three things and also multiple other problems in the games industry lead to the line of thinking of, oh my goodness, uh, maybe the games industry is coming to an end. Uh, but actually, if you look at this graph, I love graphs, uh, that's not the case. So this is a projection for the profits that the games industry could have by 2025. So this was done in 2020. So you can see $155 billion. That is the gross amount that the games industry has accumulated. So this number is actually more than movies and sports industry combined. So it's quite a bit of money. This is a pretty rich industry at the moment. So they have a lot of influence in the way that they direct technologies and um, the way that they present information to their players. So you should probably pay attention to that. And then, so the, the before slide was like, oh my God, all of these crazy things that we should look out for. Um, but let's look at some pretty cool things that games have done to help uh, society and, and technology as a whole. So at the top left, that is a screenshot taken from a demo done for uh, a new game engine. It's called Unreal Engine 5. So it is a screenshot. Again, it's not a real life photo. It is all simulated. Everything is, there's this triangle technology. Wow, every single, if you zoom in, you can zoom in pretty, uh, to very pretty detailed extent to see like the textures on the rocks. And there's this interesting lighting mechanic as well to help um, creators and game designers develop like really realistic uh, game environments. So it's really cool. And then on the bottom right, uh, we have Beat Saber. So Beat Saber, I'm sure Shauna mentioned, uh, it's, a, it's a game that does, it's in, it's in VR and it does VR really well. So you're standing in space and you have these two lightsaber swords and you're going at it, having fun. It's really great, really immersive and really puts players into the really fun state. So these are uh, achievements on, that, on, on their, in themselves, I would say. But let's look at how these technologies have helped outside of games. So here you can see for um, the, uh, the, the Unreal Engine part of things. Um, architects have actually started using Unreal Engine to prototype their different designs. So what's really cool is that it's not only a prototyping tool, but you can also simulate physics in, a, in Unreal Engine. You can simulate weather patterns. You can simulate different soil textures. So all of these things combined really makes it a very great tool for minimizing costs in the architectural field so that you, know, you don't have to actually like have a building fall down. You can have it fall down in a game. <laughs> so it's a really useful tool for making these architectural designs and such. And then on the bottom, you can see uh, that is actually The Mandalorian. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have watched it. Recommend watching it, very good show. Uh, the Mandalorian, followed, it used the Unreal Engine uh, four actually, so instead of five, to create the background for all of its um, sceneries and stuff. So they had this dome in place and at the front of the dome there were technicians and uh, designers uh, basically live like showing showcasing the environments as the actors acted in the dome. So this was done to like simulate light, realistic light and simulate realistic sounds and things like that so that there was not as much work needed to be put in the arts department to like correct light and such. It was, it was a very interesting like merge between the games and the movies industry. And then here we have uh, for virtual reality. And as again, Shauna mentioned, you can train astronauts, you can train doctors, you can train a bunch of practitioners in situations where it's pretty low risk and they're able to just practice the skills that they would need to further their careers without actually hurting anyone. And then at the top uh, right, yeah, that's right. At the top right, you can see there's, um, 
work being done also to assist uh, soldiers who are experiencing PTSD and helping them process their trauma in a very like in 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 a very immersive environment. It it has actually been shown to be very effective when doing this. So yeah, here are some pretty pretty cool things that the games industry has contributed to society. Um, so games have left a big impact and they seem to continue to do so. Um, I hope the previous slides were able to explain the relevance of games and why we should care. Uh, games have influenced our lives in quite a big way and they're not leaving anytime soon. So we should probably pay a little bit of attention to them. And I would like to start by talking about what makes games so impactful. So here, uh, just to help illustrate why games are impactful, let's compare these two games. So on the left, there is the Royal Game of War. It was created around 2500 BC and it's a pretty ancient game. And on the right, it's Halo. Uh, this is Halo 1 created by Bungie Incorporated. And this was created in 2001 AD. Thought I'd mention the eight just because we're talking 4,000 years. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. So when talking about the Royal Game of Ur, um, and when it was discovered, it was thought to be a lost game. And this is because the rules were no, they couldn't find the rules anywhere. There were mentions of this game throughout, scattered throughout history. This was um, in the Mesopotamian era. So there were, there were mentions of this game. People seemed to know it and they just seemed to know it. And because of this, no one really wrote the rules down until one day there was a tablet found, which was written by a Babylonian astronomer, I believe. And this was in 17, no, the year 177 uh, BC. And this tablet, when it was found, uh, it was uh, translated by this lovely bearded fellow over here. His name is Irvin Finkel, and he's a curator at the British Museum. And basically, after deciphering the, the tablet, we got a version of the rules. So people started playing the game. And here you can see uh, the screenshot is taken from, um, you can find it on YouTube actually. It's a playthrough between Tom Scott and Irvin, Irvin Finkel. And I, I highly recommend watching it because when you watch it, it's, it's, it's really, you, you get really into it. It's very, it's very emotionally investing for some reason. It's very tense. And it's because the game does this thing where play, there's this gameplay loop where you never know if you're actually going to win until you have won. So there's a sense of like randomness because there's a dice involved in this game. There are dice, a set of dice involved in this game. So there's this feeling of like, there's this feeling of luck. There is strategy, but there's also luck. And because of this, you get, each time you play the game, it's a new experience. It's intriguing and people keep coming back to play it. And then here we have, when we're looking at Halo 1, uh, created by Bungie Incorporated, the team that worked on the AI for this game really wanted to create a dynamic experience with the player. So it was really cool the way that they did this. They did it in a way that with the player pushed the game, pushed the AI, the AI would push back. So if the player was like, oh, I'm gonna speed run this game, I'm gonna play really fast and defeat all the enemies really fast, the game would actually throw more enemies in, would fight back and you're more likely to you know, die. But if you want to take a break, if you're like, oh, I need a break, I need to calm down a little bit, the game also allows you to calm down. Now, while this seems counterintuitive to like, oh, I don't want to calm down, I want there to be constant action, this actually, helped create this synchronicity between the game and the player where you ended up play the, every time you played the game it felt different the loop felt different and it you never again just like the royal game of Earth, you never knew if you were truly going to win until unless you won so the game does the core design philosophy behind these two games is quite similar even though they are 4,000 years apart. Uh, and the only difference is the technology that is used to deliver it. So regardless of the day and age, we seem to enjoy being immersed in these experiences. Um, I would like to 
um, actually share this quote by Johann Huizinga, which actually illustrates the points made in the previous slide. Um, so play is older than culture, for, for culture always presupposes human society, and animals have not waited for man to teach them their playing. Um, so Johann Huizinger was a cultural, or was a Dutch historian, and he's one of the founders of modern cultural history. And this quote basically summarizes to being that play has always been something that we wanted, something that we needed, and something that we have used. Oh, I think I have it in the next slide. So oh, play is instinctual, historical, and an inherent part of us. Uh, it's something that we have needed for centuries. And as time goes through goes on, uh, we have found ways to augment this with technology. So for example, VR, AR, ooh, so fun. And okay, so next topic. So we've talked about play and why it's an instinctual part of us, but now let's talk about immersion and how these two are intrinsically connected. So immersion and play are pretty, I think. Able to push that quite a bit, it's really cool. So what do you think? So uh, yeah, I'm just gonna ask a question. It's a rhetorical question. Uh, what do you think, what images pop up into your mind when you think about Egypt? Uh, uh, okay, so probably, well, I'm guessing, oh, where's my mouse? The pyramids, oh wow, crazy. Hieroglyphics, ooh, so interesting. And ancient tombs, right? So this is what like majority of people think of when they think of Egypt, usually. Um, and it, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty good impression of this civilization, but I would say that it is an ancient impression of the Civil Ages and there's no life to it, right? So let's look at how we have tried to tackle this before games were able to do so. So there's this artist named Jean-Claude, oh no, he's not an artist. He is a, he's an archeologist, architect and artist named Jean-Claude Colvin. And he created these illustrations using uh, various art, uh, archeological findings. So he has created hundreds of reconstructive drawings for different civilizations such as Rome, uh, uh, Aztecs, I think. And here we have Egypt. Uh, these drawings are great, they're wonderful. They're super detailed and they really, push the technologies that have been used in those um, civilizations and puts them in a way that we can actually see it. Um, but what if we try to take it a step further as games do? What if we could simulate the world itself? What if we could take all of these little archeological findings and components and put them in a way that helps us simulate the people, the culture and the civilization itself? Well, that's exactly what Assassin's Creed does. So Assassin's Creed is a franchise that where you have a main character and the main character goes through different historical time periods. So in Assassin's Creed Origins, which we'll talk about right now, uh, you're going through Egypt. So Jean-Claude's work uh, from the previous slide, as well as a lot of archeological findings, a lot of researchers and a lot of language experts were consulted while making this game. And because of this, we have an almost replica representation of our understanding of what Egypt was like. It's a little bit embellished because it is a game, but it's pretty cool because you get to see like here, you can see this is vegetation that actually existed near the Nile River. And here again, it's a bird eye, bird's eye view of Egypt and you can walk all around those little nooks and crannies and there are people working and there are fishermen on boats. It's kind of, it's, it's a very, it's a very interesting experience when you're in it. So here, this is how the player views Egypt. So compared to the ancient pictures and all of, all those stuff, like this is a much more alive representation. You get, while you're playing the game, you're able to actually imagine the people's thoughts, beliefs, their wants and desires. It's, it's quite, I think it's a quite immersive experience and would recommend playing it again. <laughs> so let's talk about another type of immersion, immersion into characters. So another case uh, here that I have, it's a really great game. It's called Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice and it does something pretty unique. So the game itself follows Senua 
a Celtic warrior who suffers from psychosis and she struggles with it as she tries to complete a personal quest. So the developers, while trying to emulate psychosis, uh, consulted researchers, medical health professionals, as well as, as, well as individuals who suffer from psychosis, uh, to make a, as accurate a representation as they could. And they did this by tackling two of the main types of symptoms that are associated with psychosis, uh, hallucinations and delusions. So if we look at delusions, um, I would say that a unique part about games is that once a player starts playing a game, there's almost a shift in mindset. They immediately start trying to make connections. They look to solve puzzles, they look for clues in the environment, and when they're talking to characters, they try to understand, oh, okay, is this something that I need to know for a future quest? So this mindset is surprisingly similar to behaviors that are presented in psychosis. So people with psychosis usually have objects that they hold dear to their heart, that hold, like uh, I guess, intense meaning. So every time they see these items, they connect the dots. They make connections that don't exist in real life, but they are connections nonetheless. So games here do this exact thing. Uh, even though these connections aren't real, they are real to these people. And when game, when players play games, it is it becomes real to them as well. There were often uh, play testers for this game when it was in development, who after playing the game gave feedback stating that they didn't see the mental illness in the game. They didn't really understand why mental illness was a big part of it. And this is because they were fully immersed into Senua's reality. They, it had convinced them, the game had convinced them that this was just the way that the world was. Um, so a player seeing the symbols floating around, such as the one in the left image, would make the same conclusion that Senua did, that there, that there needs to be a puzzle solved to help open the door that is shown in the picture on the right. It's pretty cool, I think. So the other part, hallucinations, were tackled in various different ways. Uh, but I would like to point out one of the strongest ways that I, has, I had seen it tackled in this game, which was the auditory hallucinations. So the developers used binary microphones. So these are microphones that captured sound in a 3D space. And when players wore headphones, they were able to hear these sounds come and go in the 3D space as well. So this gave the illusion of hearing voices. And when accompanied with the headphones, it really felt like you were hearing these voices. Um, this technique gave a deeper look into Senua's emotional state, because as emotions rose, as she felt things such as fear, frustration, or anger, the voices got louder or the voices became softer, or they disappeared, or they came back up. It, it, the way that the voices moved transferred those emotions to the player, which you wouldn't really be able to simulate in other forms of media. Maybe you could do it in movies, but because the player is pushing Senua and trying to complete the quest, it is a lot more of a uh, personal experience to the players as well. I really wish I could show you a video, but I actually thought about not doing that, specifically because I think if I show you a video, it removes from the experience. And again, try to play the game. I know they're expensive though. So uh, maybe watch a playthrough. <laughs> it's a really great game. <laughs> um, so the unique strengths of games lies within its immersive and interactive capabilities, right? So it has always been this way. The more immersive the medium is, the more immersed and interested and invested a player gets. But now with the help of technology, we are able to extend this to different subject matters, to allow people to walk in other people's shoes and to allow to see the world through different eyes. The player is immersed because they're given choice. The player makes the story move forward, climb the buildings, choose to be the hero. Okay, final part. So since technology is so important to improving the future of games, let's take a look at just that. Let's look at the role of technology in games, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I have already touched on a lot of the good parts because I honestly think that games are a great industry, but um, I think going into it in a little bit more detail will be great as well. So as I mentioned before, games have integrated with technology over the years. And because of this, they're able to create more and more interesting, engaging experiences. 
Uh, I would say the two main technologies that have pushed games to do this are game AI and game tools. So game AI works on trying to find, uh, to, trying to use complex algorithms such as k-means, MCTS, all of these. Uh, I, I chose not to go into detail for this presentation. It gets kind of dull, but uh, they use a lot of complex algorithms to analyze player behavior based on data to create engaging new content uh, using AI, so procedurally generated career content is something that happens, and to, to determining how best to retain players. So these, uh, these things are pretty important. Another thing, uh, game tools, I will elaborate, is things such as AI and, um, and AI, I put AI, but it's AR, VR. Um, so these are these are pretty immersive technologies, as you have seen already, as well as utilizing things such as the by what was it the three D sound mapping technology used in Senua's uh, in Hellblade, as I mentioned before, as well as using technologies such as Unreal to create more interesting interactions between NPCs and such. So these are. Uh, these are further pushed by advancements in game systems. So game systems such as the PS4, that, I mean, the PS5 that released and Unreal Engine, which allows for designers to create more complex games. Uh, but the future of games, I would say, is a bit rickety. And as you saw from the ban that China put on um, miners, uh, it, I think it's a pretty important uh, it's pretty important to acknowledge how these technologies have been used to, while they are used to benefit players and society have also done harm. So let's get into that. So the negatives of technology in games. Um, so technologies have enabled companies to find ways to optimize uh, retaining their players, optimize how to make players spend the most money. So while this is an okay practice overall, considering that oh, games are incredibly hard to make, um, they cost a lot of money, large teams, all that jazz, it can go a little bit too far. So take for example, loot boxes. Um, so these are boxes that players can often purchase with real money. And these boxes often act as a parallel to gambling. And the reason why I say this is because when the player purchases a box, they, the box itself usually has a pretty low chance at giving anything substantial. So the player may spend $20 to get uh, 24 loot boxes and get only one item that is actually worth their time. So because of this, um, it, it, it mimics a variable reinforcement schedule. And yeah, here it is. And as you can see over here, variable reinforcement schedules has the most number of responses. It retains players as much as possible. So companies utilize this technique of loot boxes and also things like microtransactions to retain their players as much as possible, which uh, actually ends up not being a great thing because uh, sometimes games are marketed towards minors or um, children who, who just don't have the capability to say no or understand how to say no. So it can be a little bit of a problem. Um, and then these, yeah, so these, as I mentioned already, these uh, tactics are used in pretty popular games and games that are involved, uh, who have a large player base that are children, such as Fortnite and Genshin Impact. So it's a little bit uh, questionable. So I just wanted to state some closing thoughts before I end my presentation. So the games I mentioned today are all games that I love and provide deep and thoughtful and thought provoking experiences to their players. Uh, but the power games have to provide experiences sometimes that leads to players being emotionally invested. And this emotional investment can be taken advantage of, which is what the questionable part and the, the ethics part of why we should even consider these kinds of games to begin with. So the potential of games in education, promoting social interactions and helping us understand different perspectives can be realized, but the only, but we really need to carefully approach games because the impact that they have on players is pretty immense. And yeah, that is my presentation. Thank you so much.
any questions? <laughs> yeah, well, you you already know I was going to ask this question. Now, Taryn yes. featured philosopher Alan Watts. Alan Watts had three sons who are still living and making money on his ideas, but he died mm -hmm. in 1973. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2018, a video game was made with uh, Alan Watts clips and, and quotes and so on called the uh, Everything Game. So let me just ask you a, as an example of one effect here, if you want to become a better person, it, it, if, do you think if, if you keep playing the uh, you know, Everything Game over and over, will you become more like Alan Watts? Will people come to you when they have philosophical problems or is that just absolutely stupid and, and impossible? No, actually, okay. Hmm. <laughs> I think <laughs> that's How a funny that for question. A question eh? Will you will you will you be will your mind be blown by <laughs> would you yeah. become a different person after playing a game? I would say yes and no. So um games, especially if you're younger and if you haven't tackled um topics such as Alan Watts. So um I actually have talked about the everything game that I've played it. It's amazing. Again, please play it great game um and it it's it, while you're playing it and you hear alan watts talking it is thought provoking for sure and especially if you have not heard topics that alan watts is bringing up but i will say that it it can act almost like a gateway into thinking about these topics and that in itself is great Right. Will it lead to some sort of enlightenment where you're suddenly the smartest person ever? Probably not. <laughs> but I think it is definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, and also, I would like to mention that I, I was I, when you mentioned when you wrote the email to me giving the feedback about the everything came. I was like, oh, gosh, I should have talked about it because we talked about it in our in my AI class, my game AI class and how like difficult that game was actually to make because there are different types of AI in game AI. And the one that the game utilized is called AI as everything. Literally, that's the, that's the, that's the category that it falls in, where AI is literally everything that you are surrounded with. It's the whole experience. And it's actually quite hard to make those experiences unless you progress technology in a way that like you can handle more and more intense. AI calculations. So that's why, like, when you play the game, the animals are like tumbling around <laughs> <laughs> because they could not handle the processing power and they didn't have the team size for that. <laughs> it's quite funny, everyone. If you haven't played it, please play it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I really think it's a gateway to big brain. <laughs> you yeah. will have big brain. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if. if if you think back to the you know original focus group that led to the creation of this course so they they talked about the course stretching brains right that's that's what they thought maybe the course could do and what i think is like in the video game sector if you discover just one instance that reliably made people more moral and more thoughtful and so on, then you could build on that, right? It just takes one successful instance mm -hmm. of like taking an ordinary person who's nothing special and like the video game makes them into a, sort of moving towards sainthood you know not mm -hmm. not there yet but like <laughs> ascending the ladder mm -hmm. towards sainthood yeah that this could be a big game changer right so yeah, yeah i think so <laughs> like i mentioned the game spirit fair right um mm -hmm. so it really helps like while i was playing it anyway it really helped to like to have this, this, this gateway into exploring the concept of death and how like moving on is and how like processing someone leaving you and how having that framed in a more positive light and in a light of acceptance 
really like it, like that that kind of concept could really like uh, they understand what I'm saying maybe like I it, it when I was playing it I cried a lot <laughs> as the <laughs> as each character I had to like let them move on yeah. I cried so much but like you also realize that these characters need to move on and that it is right. something that it's not healthy to hold on to them you're holding on to an image of who they are so uh, like games like that just they just they make your brain think in a different way it convinces you rather than tells you because someone right. can tell you to oh yeah process death but when you actually have to do it oh it really rewires something in there. Now, what what about moments beyond what humans are currently capable of? Like, you know, AlphaGo, the the moves that Al AlphaGo made that no human had ever made that are so beautiful and so on. Don't you think that eventually video games might possibly be able to transition our human thinking where we could actually understand, you know, higher level machine thinking. So, so that we would get why it is that AlphaGo <laughs> created these beautiful gameplay uh, mm -hmm. instances, you know? Yeah. yeah, okay. So I think to answer that question, I will go back to talking how I mentioned AAA games and indie games. So I only mentioned AAA and indie, but there's actually a hidden section of the game industry, which is games in academia, mm -hmm. is how I would describe it. So indie and AAA, uh, AAA especially, is mostly for the market. It's mostly for consumerism. It's mostly for creating experiences that generally people can enjoy. Indie tries to push the limits, but they're still trying to make money, right? But academia, they tend to push the limits, push the limits. So there have been like simulations of like they just put a bunch of ai together and watched as the ai broke the game and tried to um how do i say try to solve the problems that the that the humans were throwing at them so the ai actively kept breaking the game again and again so like just seeing how things interact oh maybe i can share that video somehow uh, it's a very great it's a great video but i think academia is trying to do that what you have mentioned about trying to go outside of what um, we what, experience. Uh, normal human thinking. Yeah, yeah, what normal human thinking is like. Right. But I think that it's not as popular because it's very expensive, <laughs> right? So unfortunately, we live in a capitalist society where people need to make money. And I don't blame anyone for doing that, right? But it does yeah. limit us to making experiences that are more palatable to the general audience versus like academia, if we could have more push towards academic games and studying academic games, um, I, I think like there would be a lot of like crazy, interesting things that show up. Right, but it isn't just fun, it's also practical. Like mm -hmm. you, you can imagine at some point in the future mm -hmm. that there will be this issue mm -hmm. of, of are humans responsible enough that they should always be allowed to live on earth and be you know accommodated or are they irresponsible enough that they should just be ignored right and who would you be debating that with you would be debating that with the sentient machines that are now mm -hmm. smarter than us and mm -hmm. you know control the oxygen level and you know pollution and the levels of oceans and all, all those kind of things mm -hmm. we don't know how but they're able to do it now so in that negotiation, it would be good if the you know negotiator had some kind of training, right? <laughs> How do you successfully to be able to actually interact with, this with a kind smarter of, yeah. than human machine? You know, and and there <laughs> could be video games that mm -hmm. would prepare you for that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. possibly. That's interesting. I I feel like there have been video games that try to tackle. AI or like simulated AI, but they always lead to the conclusion of like AI and human understanding each other. So there's Near Automata. I don't know if you know this game. Uh, it's, a, it's a it's a great game. Like it's a Japanese game, um, and it's it's a bullet hell. So you, there's like a whole bunch of bullets, and you have to dodge and wow. wow. Um, but it really it what is it? You play as a sentient AI. 
and you the game like the first run through of the game is with one AI and the next run through is another AI and I think there's around three different AIs that you play as and humans have gone extinct. Um, I think I think they're gone extinct. Oh, they, they, there might be like small populations, but they're mostly gone. And then you you kind of explore philosophical ideas from the frame of framework of an AI. But again, this is like from the perspective of a human because a human created the game. But like, I think there have been attempts, but I feel like if we could research AI and create this sort of like simulation AI and then use as a, that as a reference point and create a game, that would be more accurate. But Near Automata is another game that, again, should play it or watch it, but again, it's expensive, so I understand. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> So I guess what I what I'd ask that I think would, would make the videos better. Why don't you send me the links to some of these things that you just mentioned, yes. so that I, I can put them in the YouTube description. So, okay. So that okay. People are able to kind of go from what you're talking about to actually looking into that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. Thanks to both uh, speakers today for great talks. And um, yeah, you know, encourage your friends to take the course. I think uh, that's the best way for me to get good students in the future. I, I think we already have six or seven for next term, but you could still influence who else we get. <laughs> and also medical students, we're, we're just starting to pitch it again to first and second year uh medical students for next term so okay thank you very much and um yeah i'm happy to interact with any of you if you wish and uh, uh, in the future also okay that's it thank you very much bye-bye now <laughs>